We face some big issues uh, with respect to water uh, all over the world. I'm from California, um, and I'll use the, uh, some examples um, of the work that we're doing in California to share with you what's happening all, all over the world. Um, and it's, uh, it's, a different, it's a different future that, that we will be facing. Um, uh, our, in our introduction, I heard reference to uh, FFA, and I think um, it, it behooves us to engage uh, FFA and 4-H to get the young people uh, engaged. But you, you'll see more of what I mean as we work through this talk. These few images here, actually these were, some of these were shown in, in, in 60 Minutes. They're from animations up on the left, California, and uh, the Middle East uh, in the middle, and, and Northwest India on the right. And in that, in that 60 Minutes um, piece, you can hear me um, uh, professing uh, the, the very, uh, my very deep insight that yeah, red is bad. Um, so um, my my wife likes, likes to give me a hard time about that. Okay, so let's see if we can actually operate the machine. And um, not not yet. Here we go. This is going to be fun. Two true confessions of a hydrologic scientist. That's me. I wanted to be a veterinarian. <laughs> uh, okay, so overview. Uh, I went to college to be a veterinarian, actually. And uh, uh, let's just say I was unprepared for the rigors of uh, pre-med, pre-vet. And uh, animals are better off without me, I think. Uh, okay, so uh, overview. Who am I and, 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 and why do I care? How, you know, what, are, what are some of the things we're going to talk about? Um, some key examples of the importance of water to animal agriculture. You know, I'm, I'm just stating the obvious. You folks know a lot better than I do. Um, but where I really want to spend most of my time is what our research and the best science is telling us about fresh water availability, water cycle change. By water cycle change, I mean not only changing fresh water availability, but are we seeing the change in the intensity of, uh, and frequency of things like flooding and drought um, and, and global change. And then how will the industry respond in the future? Not that, not that I know, uh, uh, you know, um, but uh, I will try to tie that to you know, what I see happening with, with water to sort of inform you. This is, this is what we see happening. And so you can think about how the you know, best way for your, uh, uh, your industry to respond. Okay, so who am I and why do I care? I'm a hydrologist, as you heard in the introduction. That means that I study water, and in particular, how it, you know, where it is on the surface and the subsurface and how it, how it moves uh, over and through the land surface. I'm a professor at UC Irvine. Before that, I was at uh, uh, University of Texas at Austin. And I'm a research scientist now. I am the senior water scientist at the NASA Jet Propulsion uh, Laboratory, which is, which, is, which is pretty cool because we get to design satellites and, and work with a number of satellite missions. We just launched a new satellite mission called SMAP, uh, which stands for Soil Moisture Active Passive. But really what it will do is map the moisture in the upper a few centimeters of soil uh, globally. Um, every few days. And so that may or may not be of use to, uh, to animal ag. Uh, hopefully it will be. Certainly should be to, to, to plant agriculture in terms of uh, planting irrigation. My students and I have been working for, th for three decades now, which is scary, on using satellites to track how freshwater availability is changing around the world. Uh, we develop advanced computer models to predict how it might change in the future. And we do a lot of work, and it's one of the reasons why I'm here, on communicating findings to elected officials, to water managers, uh, to industry, and, and to the general public. And so that can be lectures, that can be visits to Washington, D.C., or in my case, Sacramento, uh, and um, uh, uh, public talks. Um, you know, I've spoken to the local rotary clubs, you know, all the way up to big international conferences. Um, and why do I care, why do I do this, especially on the communication side? Um, the findings that, that we are coming across, that we are making, uh, are really, really eye-opening. As you know, you got a glimpse in that intro slide. Uh, and they're not really fully appreciated, not only by the public, 
um, but also by our water managers and by our elected officials. And so uh, I work pretty hard on trying to trying to make that happen. Uh, and also because, you know, seeing what we see, water management has a long way to go to, to adjust. Um, and I'll give you some examples from, from California and really across the United States and maybe even around the world. The, the problems that we face in the future uh, and your industry will face in the future are uh, uh, of such concern and so large in scope that it, it behooves you to start thinking about from now about the second half of the century because some of the changes that you may need to make or that may be made uh, in water, in water rights, in water law will take that, will take that long right? because you know it's very, very complicated. Uh, okay, so importance of water to animal agriculture. I hope you appreciate my efforts with the pictures on the bottom. Okay. <laughs> Normally, I would have a picture of like a well and uh, you know something with a, a river or something. Uh, okay, so uh, you know one of the biggest uses users of or uses of water uh, is is to grow is to grow feed, and that is actually not really that well appreciated. In I mean you appreciate it, but uh, it's not really that well appreciated. I think in on my side, you know, in in my world. Uh, and these are, you know, I'm just sort of winging it here, writing some of these things down. Again, you know, you know better than I do. Uh, water to grow feed, water for processing and packaging, water associated with energy needs. All, I'm, all I, I mean there is that, you know, it takes water to produce energy. So, uh, keep, you know, keep that in mind when you're thinking about lowering, lowering your, your overall uh, environmental uh, footprint. It takes water to produce energy, it takes energy to heat and treat and transport water, so they are intimately linked. Um, climate change and these changing extremes of flooding and drought, you know, I think there's going to be, uh, and I'll get to this towards the end, implications for, first of all, exposure of, uh, of animals, but also threats to supply chains, for, for example. And then, of course, the big one, animal waste and water quality issues. I'm not a water quality guy, so I, I, won't, I won't dwell on that stuff. But, uh, uh, of course, uh, you know, if we grow uh, and raise animals to eat, they have waste, and we have to do things. We have to figure out some clever ways to, to deal with that because I like hamburgers. Um, okay, so, and everyone else does too. So uh, I'm not up here to say, you know, oh, agriculture is bad. Uh, we have worked for a long time with this satellite called GRACE, and GRACE stands for Gravity Recovery and Climate Experiment. And we started working with it before it launched. Uh, it launched in 2002. And I like to say that it functions like a scale in the sky. I think there's supposed to be, there it is. There's another there. I wanted to show you for scale the, the, the guys in the lab working on the on the satellites. So they're not they're not very big. Okay, so this thing functions like a scale in the sky. How does that how does that work? You can see the satellites are not very big. They orbit, they're actually up about four hundred kilometers. They're separated by about two hundred kilometers. So like from the, our perspective on Earth, they're kinda of tiny and they're way the heck out there. But and they follow each other around in a in a in a tandem orbit when they when they orbit together, we call it a tandem orbit. And it's near polar, so they go over the poles, and you know, the Earth is spinning, and they're just going like this. Um, and so, you know, it takes about a month to get complete coverage of the Earth. But what's happening, why do I say it's like a scale in the sky? Because when there's more mass on the ground, say because of a big snowstorm, um, uh, or, a giant, or a giant flood, when there's more mass on the ground, there's a greater gravitational tug on those satellites. Okay, more mass on the ground, it tugs and pulls the satellites down just a little bit, really maybe just a few millimeters. <clears throat> but those measurements are so accurate that they can be uh, they can be recorded with with uh, with great precision. Um, and likewise, when the satellites uh, fly over a region that has less water, say because of groundwater depletion or because of a drought like we're having out west, then the ground actually weighs less. There's less of a gravitational tug. Right? And the satellites fly a little bit higher in their orbit. So the satellites are always sort of moving up and down, and the distance between them is changing a little bit. Um, and it's all based on the, the distribution, really the, the movement of water and how it, how it changes Earth's gravity field. So by mapping that very carefully, we're actually able to produce maps globally every month of the regions around the world uh, that are gaining water mass or losing water mass. Okay. It doesn't work uh, 
uh, it's a relatively low resolution satellite, meaning it's not like a spy satellite that can track what you're doing in, in your backyard every, every 15 minutes. It's more like monthly data over large areas, like 100, 150,000, 200,000 square kilometers. The Wabash River Basin is about uh, 100,000 square kilometers. Illinois is about 100,000 square kilometers. Southern California is about 150,000, 200,000 square kilometers. So that's the scale <coughs> that we're talking about. Um, this uh, grace is actually coming to the end of its of its lifetime, and uh, but thankfully we have a follow-on coming, and it's called cleverly the Grace Follow-on, and it will be launched in in 2017. It won't improve. It's not really a big improvement. It's just continuing the measurements. We call it a climate uh, continuation mission. Uh, okay, so to kind of summarize what I was talking about. We don't want to look at that yet. Pretend you didn't see that. Um, okay, so <clears throat> um, again, just sort of summarizing, we map Earth's gravity field every month with this GRACE mission by looking at the changes on a monthly basis. We can actually see the places that are gaining and losing water. The reason that that works is that water is ridiculously heavy. Um, what we're really seeing are the changes in what we call the total uh, the total water storage, uh, all of the water stored in a river basin. Uh, again, this could be the Wabash River Basin uh, right out, out here. And so what Grace tells us is sort of the delta S, the change in all of the surface water, soil, moisture, snow, and groundwater together. If we want to split that up and look at groundwater, we have to get more, more information. And it doesn't tell us the absolute amount. It just tells us the change. Okay. And so you can kind of see it here. Here's a chart for the Colorado River Basin um, showing the ups and downs of the total water storage. And so the peaks are wet season, the troughs are dry season. This is about 2004, and this is about 2014. So we see wet season, dry season, wet season, dry season, but we also see a trend. And I'll get to what that trend is uh, a little bit later. So that's one way to look at the data. Uh, another way, <clears throat> now you can actually look at this animation. Now we're just mapping out, plotting out, animating uh, the wet, you know, the ups and downs of water storage. And blue is wetter than normal and, and, and uh, red is drier than normal. So we're about to come into the big California drought here out west. And so, you know, we should get pretty red and should be very dramatic. And, um, so again, just another way to, to visualize the data. We do this globally. We do it, we do it regionally. Uh, all right, so let's talk about, again, you know, uh, for a, an example, talk about California. This is the latest time series, the latest chart that shows the ups and downs of, of total water storage in California. This is really all of the water, actually not all of California, but the, the river basins outlined in red here uh, on the, uh, up on the right. That's the Sacramento and San Joaquin River basins. That's basically most of the water in California. The Sierras are there, the Central Valley with all of its groundwater is there. Um, and so this, this chart shows the ups and downs of water storage going back right to the beginning of the mission, so around 2002. Um, so again, we can see the uh, wet seasons, dry seasons, um, and then we get into this period here from 2006 to 2010, which was a big drought. Okay, we get a little recovery, and then here, this is where we are now. And if we had the data right now, which we don't yet, would be like right about here. Okay, and so this is this precipitous drop off that's happening in California. And what that, what that means quantitatively is that for each of the last three years, California's lost about uh, uh, how many trillion gallons? I don't even know, about eight trillion gallons per year, about 12 million acre feet of water per year for the last, for the last three and a half years. And about two thirds of that has been, has been groundwater. And so just put that number in perspective, because you know, acre feet is kind of a strange unit, and it's very difficult to think about what you know x trillion gallons means. All Californians uh, each year use about 10 million acre feet of water. Okay, so all for domestic, all 38 million Californians for domestic and municipal use use about 10 million acre feet. So we're losing more than all Californians use each each year. Okay, so this is, it's, it's, serious, it's serious business. I mean, if you're not from out there, anyone from the West who, who knows about what's going on in California, just you and me and 
three or four or five. Okay, now the hands are now we're all Californians. Uh, so yeah, it, 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 it's really bad. So just to bring you up to speed, uh, we've been seeing this for the last three years. We've been seeing groundwater depletion. We've had virtually no snowpack. Reservoirs are down at super low levels. Um, and so we're relying, shifting to 100%, or we will be shifting to 100% groundwater. Uh, groundwater is the water that's stored under the ground in soils and in aquifers. Uh, and the reason that's a problem is because a lot of the groundwater is non-renewable. And in California, it is not yet managed. So the fear, my fear, and the fear of many others is that there'll be sort of a, you know, a, a water rush um, uh, to, get, to get wells in the ground. Because we had some legislation passed at the end of the year, at the uh, no, actually in September 2014, but it will be a few decades before we can actually implement something of that scope. So there is a bit of a water rush going on, and so this is, I mean, this is a big issue. We have to be thinking about, uh, you know, we're think about the the uh, continuation of what these charts are going to look like in the future. This is how it looks spatially. Uh, those are just some dry seasons showing the progressive, uh, progressive uh, worsening of the, of the dry seasons. Another thing to point out, a little bit of a subtle point, this is our last, this is last year, this is last winter. The winter is our wet season, okay? So last winter's wet season was drier than all, almost all of the previous dry seasons. This year's, when we get the data, wet season will be down here, so definitely drier than all the previous dry seasons. So, you know, we're not, we're having no, if it were like a bank account, there's no income coming in. And so we're living off the savings, which are groundwater. The reservoirs don't really make a big difference. The reservoirs are more like, you can only store a few years of water anyway. And so they're more like your short-term checking account. So we have no income. The checking account is draining, and now we're hitting the bank account. And of course, if you're hitting your you know, long-term savings retirement account, you want to be really careful with it. And that's not quite happening yet in, in California. The other thing is that when you have data like this, you can see that there are different time scales of uh, this drought occurrence. And some people are saying, oh, it's a three-year drought. Other people are saying, oh, it's a six-year drought. And when I look at these data, there's an overall downward trend. So California is losing water on many, many timescales, and a lot of it is groundwater. Uh, uh, you know, one of the cool things about the, I'm gonna skip this one, this sort of gets into um, how, we can quantify, how we can quantify drought and the intensity of drought, and that's what I tried to show there in, in red for California, where we can kind of begin to look at the beginning of a drought, the end of a drought, how severe it is, uh, and there's just increasing trend in the severity of the drought. Okay, I want to get onto groundwater because it's really, really important for agriculture, plant agriculture, animal agriculture, uh, uh, aquaculture. It's 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 uh, it's critical. Uh, groundwater accounts for really about 33% of water withdrawals worldwide, and so that means about two billion people or more really now rely on groundwater as their primary water source. Half or more of irrigation water is supplied by groundwater. Again, this is our water that's under the ground in our soil and rock aquifers, and in many, many places it's non-renewable. It's non uh, groundwater, as I just mentioned, also provides this, the key strategic reserve for water supply during prolonged periods of drought, meaning when there's no water in our rivers and our reservoirs, like we're facing in California right now. We don't have that much, have a year or so worth of water. We hit the groundwater really hard. Right now, we get 75% of our uh, statewide water supply from, from groundwater. Uh, so ironically, as we look around the world, the groundwater is poorly uh, monitored and managed, uh, ironic because it's so important, uh, in many regions of the world. So the global water security is really uh, at much greater risk than, than people realize. Now. Briefly, how do we extract? I want to get into what's happening with groundwater in a little bit more detail, and just kind of show you graphically the Grace Mission. Here's a here's a big river basin like the the Wabash, or think of it as your local uh, river basin. Maybe it's the Ohio River, the Upper Missouri, whatever. Uh, so Grace tells us the change in the total water storage each month. And if we want to figure out how much of that change is just the groundwater, we need to basically subtract the soil moisture, the weight of the soil moisture, and the surface water, and the, and the snow. It's just like if you got on a scale, right, and you figured out that you gained 10 pounds over whatever the last day because the meeting was so awesome and you ate so much great food. Uh, if you wanted to know 
how much of that weight you know you gained in your ears and how much you gained in your thumbs and how much you gained in your knees you or the scale just gives you one number you need other data sets right other observations to to pull it apart so that's what we do with the grace data we use other satellites we use data on the ground we use data from computer models uh, basically we use the best information that we that we have and it kind of depends on, on where we're at uh, Try not to dwell too much more on, on the details of California, except that the Central Valleys are a hugely rich uh, and productive ag area, including dairy, right? So, uh, and we use a ton of groundwater. We use about 20% of all the groundwater in the United States. And that aquifer, the blue aquifer, the Central Valley aquifer, is the second most pumped in the United States after the Ogallala or the High Plains aquifer, which is across the Midwest. Uh, oh, I should show that picture there. Stay, stay. That one. Okay. Uh, one of the things that happens when we pump groundwater is that the ground actually sinks. It subsides. And in some places, in, in, just like letting air out of a, a bicycle tire or a car tire, it deflates. You pull groundwater out of the ground, and uh, in some places it deflates. It depends on the, on the hydrogeology. And so this is a picture that's showing fa a famous picture of USGS scientist Joe Poland uh, going back uh, to 1977 and show it on a telephone pole where the ground surface was in 77 versus when he's standing there, whatever year that is. It's about, oh, sorry, 20, 23, 25 to 77. So over 50 years, it's about a foot per year subsidence. And that is ongoing. There are places across the southern part of the Central Valley and the San Joaquin Valley where, where uh, subsidence is going on a foot per year. Huge problems for infrastructure, right? Uh, so... Let me get to the point here. This is when we go through this exercise of figuring out what's happening with groundwater in California. It looks like this. And so what's important to recognize here is that it's really, really difficult to put together a chart like this. So if we waited for a government agency to do this, um, it would probably take us about 10 years uh, because it's just a different process when you do it from the bottom up right, using information from wells in the ground and computer models um, versus doing it from the top, right, top down with, with satellites. The two are both are I I extremely important. We need to use them together. Um, but we see these, again, these, these, these scales of groundwater depletion during the last drought and uh, during the current drought here all the way on the right. And so I will try to uh, put these into a different, a different context. Uh, right now. That's the same chart, black, okay? The black line is the groundwater. Those stripes in the background, those bars in the background, in California, we, you know, you know, we move a lot of water around. And uh, we move it around through uh, that aqueduct system, okay? And we move it mostly from north to south. And the amount of water that is transferred is a political decision. And that's what's shown in the bar, with the bars. There's the red and blue represent the two major water projects. So they're showing each year how much surface water, how much a river water comes from the snowmelt, comes from the Sierras, how much is available every year to the farmers. And in a good year, that amount is 70%, 80%, 100%. And in a drought, by definition, there's no surface water. Right, and so the allocations, the amount of water put into the canals sent from the north to the south is, is cut back. And so in the 2006 to 2010 uh, drought, the uh, cutbacks got down to 20 or so percent. Um, and then over here, this is where we are right now, our cutbacks are like 0 percent and 15 percent. And so the point of this is as follows. When surface water is available, groundwater recovers. So the availability of surface water is the bars, they increase, the groundwater shown in black recovers. Farmers have their surface water cut, of course they have to use groundwater. Okay, little recovery during the wet period and then the current drought. And this is so bad, these cutbacks are so bad that like everyone fears that the groundwater is basically gonna go to, go to hell. Uh, okay, so a longer term view, going back to 1962, this is what we do with groundwater. Uh, the red are from USGS, the green is from our GRACE data. The colors in the background represent wet periods or dry periods. And the wets are the blues, okay? So deeper blue is wetter. And the tans are dry, okay? So a couple of take home points here. One, you know, we've been in overall decline for a long period of time, actually since we began uh, pumping groundwater, okay? 
and the other is our history of water use, of groundwater use, is a little bit of recovery in those blue periods, right? The blue colors in the background because that's representing climate, and then a big decline in a drought, and a little bit of recovery and a big decline. Okay, so that's the definition of unsustainable, right? When you're taking out and mining, when you're taking out more than is going back in, and so we're doing this, right? And what we need to do, what we need to do, is kind of figure out how to do this rather than rather than this. This is happening all over the world. Okay. Um, Here's the Colorado River Basin. So now we're going to look at, out at the rest of the world. Um, Colorado River Basin, again, if you're from out west, you know that most of the time to monitor whether or not there's a drought, everybody looks at the reservoirs. And everybody looks at Lake Mead, America's biggest reservoir, and looks at that big bathtub ring. And that's great and everything, but they're, and it's important. And it's an important reminder of the drought. But the reality is that when you split up that gray signal, that gray signal of the total water storage into its components, and you look at how much is surface water, that's shown in red, those are the two big reservoirs, Lake Powell and Lake Mead, versus the groundwater shown in blue, right? You see that the, the losses in Lake Mead, as big as they, and Lake Powell, as big as they are, the groundwater losses are six or seven times bigger, and that's because there's no management, no one's really paying attention, okay? All of the Colorado River packs, they don't, Groundwater is done state by state. It's not an interstate thing. Uh, okay, now we're looking at the United States. This is a map of the long-term trends from 2002 to 2014. The reds are losing water. The blues are gaining water. We see a couple of things here when we look at the United States. We see a wetter upper half. We see a drier southern half. And then we see these spots that really correspond to our big agricultural regions, uh, Central Valley and the southern high plains, and really all across the all across the southeast. Um, so something to keep in mind, uh, because that's a pretty stable pattern. Um, these are some of the outs, so now we're looking to take a broader perspective going globally, uh, or starting to move towards global. This is some of the uh, pictures that I showed um, in the beginning of the talk. And so we've actually written papers on some of the, the greatest spots for groundwater depletion around the world. Uh, which include California uh, at the top, the Middle East, and they're sort of before, after, right? Like beginning of the time period is green, more water. Uh, later in the time period uh, is red. So Middle East in the middle, India at the bottom, and just the rates of depletion uh, over on the right, just showing that, you know, we've done this many times. I'll show you a slightly different view of this. Uh, let's see if we can get that other one to work. Sometimes I like showing these. Sometimes I, it's like watching paint dry. Just remember, red is red is bad. I need to figure out. I need to figure out how to really make these things move fast. Okay, take it slow. Right. Yeah, that's a good point. Right, I'll remember. I'll remember that. Okay. Uh, this is the, the global picture, okay? And the reds again are losing water, the blues are gaining water. Uh, the biggest losers are the ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica, and glaciers like Alaska and, and Patagonia. I can barely see that red dot, so like if I'm pointing to something completely wrong, just don't hold it against me. Um, and a lot of those other red spots are aquifers, right? And so the Central Valley, the High Plains Aquifer, the Warney Aquifer, and these, by the way, are, are huge agricultural regions. So groundwater depletion and these red spots are corresponding to our ag regions. The Middle East, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, North China Plain. Actually, this is a big mining region here in Northwest, uh, Northwest Australia. So, you know, we have issues, some of the charts for, uh, you know these different these different aquifers. Again, the correspondence, of course, between the, the groundwater depletion and uh, this just go off. Uh, correspondence between groundwater depletion and and uh, uh, agriculture, right there. It's 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 one to one. The other thing to think about with respect to climate change is how the patterns are going to play out. And one of the things that we're looking at and the climate model suggests is that the wet areas of the world are getting wetter, and that is borne out by this, by this map, and that the dry areas of the world are getting drier. Uh, and so, again, that's something for you folks to think about, right, where these spots are, where, you know, where, where uh, agriculture is, is taking place, 
do we as a society need to, you know, need to move north? Uh, right, I know that is seriously right. Then, like the growing season in North Dakota is is increasing, uh, but it is a it is a crisis, and so we have to begin paying attention to it. Communicating. Uh, this is a little movie. It's me trying to communicate to agriculture, but it's crops, right? It's plant agriculture. It's in California, and it shows you the challenges that that I face. Let me be abundantly clear about this. California faces a water crisis of potentially epic proportions. You know, how we respond today will define who we are tomorrow. Here locally, need additional storage. You know, I mean, they built reservoirs for a reason. Shasta, Hoover. If you owe the bank and the county taxes, you're going to try to farm as much as you can. They're not going to make more water. The only solution to this thing is conservation. I agree we should look into conservation, but that's not going to yield or have any effect on our groundwater shortage. I didn't want to, I, I didn't want to get into this, but your arguments about conservation and efficiency are just wrong. And if you're right, the conservation and efficiency isn't going to get us anything. And if I'm right, that there's not a lot of new supply out there, then what are we left with? Take land out of production. I don't know anyone who, I don't know anyone who wants that. Your arguments just don't make any sense. You have to live in the valley. You have to understand the management of water here. Well, that's bad management. And, that, and you're one of the managers. I'm sorry. Every, every, every river, that, that whole system is... I wanted to make clearly the statement that we do face a crisis now. Uh, uh, of epic proportions, and, and I said that. Um, and I'm not sure that it really resonated, which to me is a little startling. When we talk about water... Uh... We need a plan, and we don't have one. And it is complex. We're screwed, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Well, uh, things haven't really changed. Uh, uh, so, so listen, here's, here's some messages to think about. The water cycle and water availability are changing, okay? And like you heard, you know, we need to be planning for the future. Uh, water availability will become progressively more strained in some regions, right? And those blue regions are going to get better. So we're not, like, losing water. It's just moving from, from the dry regions to the, to the wetter regions. Uh, but we will also see in the dry regions more, more drought and in the wet regions more flooding. So it's not going to be a nice sort of steady redistribution. Uh, you know, message number two, everybody loves food. So don't feel like you're a target. Uh, what I always say is we need to change the conversation from urban versus ag, you know, us versus them, farmers versus fish in California, uh, economy versus environment, to really, you know, how are we going to allocate, how are we going to better allocate water to the things that we want to do? How much are we going to use for agriculture? How much are we going to use for environment? How much are we going to use to support uh, um, economic growth? These are complicated decisions, but we need to be thinking about sort of a, a portfolio. Um, and right, or you know, how can we produce the best or or, or the most, uh, say, in agriculture using the least amount of water? Message number three: Clearly, animal agriculture uses tons of water and generates considerable waste, or right? you know, has these disposal problems. Again, no need to shy away from it. In some of our phone conferences, I just said like, hey, you know. You guys should try to own this. Don't shy away from it. Uh, because we need to eat and we need to grow food. And of course the waste disposal is a problem. But you can work on it. We have the, we have the technology and we have the resources uh, to, uh, to do that. Um, and with focused uh, attention to it, you know, we can do a great, we can do a great job. So you know, take ownership, articulate the issues, and really think about becoming industry leaders. Uh, and this is, uh, you know, again, I don't really know what you're doing, and so you may already be doing this. Uh, but again, be thinking about, you know, how can we raise the best product while having the smallest environmental impact, which, you know, may be what you're doing already. But now just think about the water because it's, uh, it's a problem. So I'm done. These are just some resources for communication. Everything, a lot of stuff I talked about is on my website. And then Twitter and blah, 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 all that stuff is there.